The purpose of this video is to help with some of the finer points of blood draw. So as we begin to look at the arm, we would then place the tourniquet and place the tourniquet tight but not too tight, uh, relative to about 40 millimeters of mercury. There are a few adjuncts that we can use to accentuate the veins, one being a stress ball that you don't need to pump, you can just hold stiff. Then unbend the elbow, straighten it so that you can see the veins clearly and you can look in the antecubital area where it's the most common place to find a good vein. You can see those and, and then you could look down the arm on the radial side, the cephalic veins, and then down in the dorsum of the hand there are often some veins that work nicely for dentistry as you don't have to worry about the elbow bending during treatment. When you look in the dorsum of the hand where there's a bifurcation of the vein is a nice place to insert your needle um, so it won't move. In this particular instance we're going to choose one of the cephalic veins off the antecubital area um, that we'll use for the reasons that we can see it very clearly and that it won't roll on us because it's bound in, in the connective tissue very nicely. So we take our alcohol gauze and use a circular motion to swab around the area, careful not to contaminate, and check for soiling to make sure that it's nice and clean. One technique is to place the gauze, the corner of the gauze, in the area where you plan to insert your needle so that you can remember where it is and not miss. And so we use the butterfly needle very often um, because it's easier for blood draw, particularly for a beginner, and it has a nice little flash component that you can see when you place it into the vein. You see the flash that comes in. Then you can tape that down or, or hold it steady as your assistant draws the blood. We didn't have an assistant in this case so we tape it down so it doesn't move. It stays secure and then draw in the blood. And we draw the yellow tops first because they have an anticoagulant inside the tube so they, they won't clot the red blood cells. And be sure to agitate that eight times um, so that the anticoagulant, the sodium citrate, will be incorporated into the blood. Then you can draw the red tubes that don't have an anticoagulant within them. You don't need to agitate those at all. Uh, in fact, you want to be a little careful with them. Draw them as quickly as you can so that they don't clot um, before you get them into the centrifuge. As you begin your blood draw, you'll want to place the tube in a fashion where you'll fill from the bottom of the tube to the top of the tube so that you can follow the stream of blood as it enters into the vacutainer tube. The stream will eventually get less and less as the vacuum becomes less and then you'll know that you're completed with that tube and you can go on to the next tube or complete your blood draw. The tourniquet can be removed at the beginning of the blood draw as you won't need it any longer. That was just to plump up the vein so that you can get into the vein. After you've completed drawing all of the blood that you need for the particular procedure, take those tubes directly to the centrifuge and spin them as quickly as possible so that the red blood cells don't clot before you can spin them down. After you've completed that, you can remove the needle from the vein. This particular butterfly needle has a safety feature, a push button safety feature on it that will retract the needle so that you won't stick yourself, the patient, or your assistant. You'll get your gauze ready before you retract the needle and then push the safety button, retract the needle, and place the gauze over the vein to compress the vein and stop the bleeding. You can check that before you place the tape on to make certain that there's no hematoma forming and if all looks well then go ahead and tape it down. When you bring the tubes to the centrifuge, place them in the centrifuge opposite each other so that they're equal on both sides and as the centrifuge spins then it will have equal weight and won't rock back and forth as it spins around. If you have an odd number of tubes you can take a blank tube, an empty tube, and place some water in it. Mark it so you know that it's intended to be that way and place it in so that it will have the equal weight and close the lid and then you can turn the centrifuge on to the required setting. 2700 RPMs is the recommended setting for many of the platelet concentrates for a period of 12 minutes. You can see with the tachometer that setting there that was marked on this C858 um, yields 2700 RPMs. 
and if you use a different centrifuge, the C818 or the C808, then you'll get 3400 RPMs, and the truth is it just hasn't shown to be any different at all. After the spin, you pull the tubes out and you can see that there's the red blood cells that have been spun down to the bottom as they're heavier, and then there is a fibrin clot in the middle, and a supernatant, the platelet-poor plasma, on the top. Release the top, and place your cotton pliers in and pull the clot up out of the tube, and you can see the red blood cells will very often come with the clot, and you'll want to trim those red blood cells off. You don't want to trim them all completely off though because much of the buffy coat layer and the growth factors are contained within a little bit of the red, red blood cells. So you'll cut those off and then you can blot away some of the red blood cells keeping the buffy coat layer and place that clot into your holder and then place the weighted squisher on top of it and close it to keep it moist. After just a few minutes it will then be flattened down so that you can remove the holder from, from the casing and release the top and you can see that the fibrin clots will be sometimes adhered to the squisher and sometimes on the holder itself. You can remove those clots off of the squisher if it, if it does stay on top of there. Then you can go directly to the mouth with them or you can use them in whatever fashion that you need to. As you can see, they are quite pliable and you can stretch them, you can suture to them, you can fold them, you can place bone within them. They, they have many different properties that you can use to be able to incorporate uh, bone and incorporate the fibrin clot into whatever procedure that you're using. We can also use the platelet concentrate contained in the yellow top tubes that had the anticoagulant, so therefore a, a clot will not form within the platelet concentrate. We're interested primarily in the layer closest to the red blood cells that contains the vast majority of the growth factors. So we take a syringe and draw off the upper layer, which will be roughly two to two and a half cc's of fluid from a 10 milliliter tube. You will then be left with roughly two to two and a half cc's of fluid that has a greater concentration of growth factors that we can then use in the surgical procedure to maximize the number of platelets and growth factors for greater wound healing. We have been injecting that fluid directly into the wound and around the wound for greater healing properties with much success, but many surgeons prefer to form a clot with that growth factor, and that can be accomplished by incorporating calcium chloride into the plasma. With a yield of two to two and a half cc's of plasma, the appropriate amount of calcium chloride would be four drops. Not four drops from the needle itself, but four drops from the top of the syringe without the needle. So you can add the four drops into the plasma and allow that to set roughly about 30 minutes. If you heat that mixture, then it will happen a little bit quicker. After it's had the appropriate amount of time to clot, you can see that a clot forms. You could incorporate bone into this clot, or you could drape this clot around your bone graft into a wound, into an extraction site, however you like. You could also form a clot inside of a tube if you don't want to get the glass dish. You just take the red top tube and and remove the top from it. It does not have an anticoagulant in it. So then you have the two to two and a half cc's of fluid. This is actually um, closer to four cc's of fluid. And so we have seven drops that go into that of the calcium chloride, then that will form a clot within that tube. Again, allowing it to set for about 30 minutes. So with the miracle of time-lapse photography, you can see the 30 minutes has passed and a clot is now formed within the tube that you can then use in the surgical procedure. I discussed earlier about the necessity to get the tubes after they're drawn to the centrifuge before the red blood cells coagulate as the red top does not have an anticoagulant. And you can see if you spin it down, you'll get 
some plasma there, but you'll see there's no clot formed at all. The clot is all formed in the red blood cells. So all of the growth factors are then trapped in the red blood cells and basically renders that useless. One other thing to be cognizant of is when you place the tubes into the centrifuge, you'll want to be careful not to put your finger over the top of the tube because you'll get some blood invariably on your finger. And then when you close the lid of the centrifuge, then you'll get blood on the lid.